You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Friday the 24th of May. Woolwich, the headlines. Not really as Afghanistan comes to London, finishes the story. The icing on the cake as troops advise not to wear uniform outside bases. Dutch Prime Minister European olive oil rules are bizarre. It'll be easier to become a Dane. Amnesty, EU states guilty of racism and homophobia. Syria rebels threaten to wipe out Shiite and Alawite towns. Afghan university students protest against women's rights. Boy Scouts of America vote to admit openly gay youths. Thought for the day, the beginning of the end or the start of a new beginning. UK News. This presenter would like to say that she, the team at World at Eight and Radio Britain, wholly condemn not only the two killers of drummer Lee Rigby, but the laws of this country, which for the last 50 years have encouraged, both financially and socially, the immigration to the UK of millions of people from Muslim and third world countries around the globe. This line has surely now been drawn in our blood. This text is from Aimno Kafar, our European news researcher. It's taken all my energy to continue to send you this. I am terribly upset and saddened. I will continue, though, in the name of drummer Lee Rigby, 2nd Battalion, the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers. Indeed, the events of the last few days have touched everyone in Britain in many different ways, and our editor was lost with carrying today's programme forward until I'm No Kafir's research came through. Woolwich, the headlines, say it all. Suspect was inspired by a cleric banned from UK after urging, behead our enemies. Woolwich attack, Lee Rigby murder highlights twin threats of EDL and individualised jihad. Woolwich attacks could not have been stopped by Snoopers Charter, says Eric Pickles. Woolwich killers were under watch for eight years, so why didn't MI5 act? Michael Adi Bolejo, from a decent Christian boy to a crazed zealot. Heard in blood, Chowdhury reveals possible preacher who brainwashed Woolwich killers. Far-right group English Defence League vows its war. Riggers, a true warrior, tributes to beheaded dad. Terror suspects X, he was a normal, regular boy. Footy mad class joker who turned into killer extremist. Killer's best pearl was another hero soldier who died in Iraq. Do not fear loonies, support help for the heroes with pride. PM wants investigation into MI5. Is this the taste of things to come? Communities defeat terrorism. Islam does not turn men to terror. Attacks on Muslims spike after Woolwich killing. Extremists will not divide our armed forces. Help for heroes deluged with donations. Betrayal of a hero father. How MI5 spent eight years watching violent ex-prisoner who preached outside Poundland, just yards from murder scene, only days before soldier was hacked to death. Stop giving airtime to idiots and nutters, Vorzy tells TV. Minister warns the BBC over fanatics following Woolwich murder. Man and woman, both 29, arrested on suspicion of conspiracy to murder following Woolwich terror attack. Loving husband and son, proud dad and a true warrior, family's tribute to soldier, hacked to death on London street. Attacks on soldiers incredibly hard to prevent. Ex-MI6 chief warns, as ministers say, controls are difficult in a free society. Not really as Afghanistan comes to London, finishes the story. There's no need to go fight the Taliban in Afghanistan, not when they are already living in London in public housing. Daniel Greenfield writing for the Canada Free Press. After telling the story of Mohammed's boast that he would make the mountain come to him, only to be forced to go to it, Francis Bacon observed, if the mountains will not come to Mohammed, Mohammed will go to the mountain. Americans, Englishmen, Frenchmen and countless others went to the Muslim world, hoping to turn it into another Boston, another London and another Paris. Instead, Boston, London and Paris are turning into another Kabul, another Islamabad and another Mogadishu. 
Muhammad has already come to the mountain. Five years ago, the sight of Muslim terrorists beheading British soldiers was a horror that could happen in Afghanistan or Iraq. Now it has happened in broad daylight in the capital of the United Kingdom. In a decade, 600,000 white Londoners have fled that city. Those are the sorts of numbers you'd expect from the Syrian civil war. Their place has been taken by the million Muslims occupying the city. 80% of Somalis in the UK live in public housing. They have the lowest employment rate of every immigrant group in the country. And within four years, they had managed to rack up over 10,000 arrests. Every effort to integrate them has failed. Rather than the Somalis becoming British, shards of Britain have become little Mogadishus. World Date says, This is because black is a stronger shade on the charts than white. Mixed, you just get sludge. The icing on the cake as troops advise not to wear uniform outside bases. Commanders have advised troops not to wear uniform travelling to and from work or outside bases following the brutal killing of a member of the military close to Woolwich Barracks. Defence sources said that the order had been given that uniform should not be worn by those travelling alone or on public transport as a common sense precaution immediately after the killing. A source stressed the order was temporary while investigations into the killing carried on and the decision would be reviewed in the next few days. Colonel Richard Kemp, who commanded British forces in Afghanistan, said it would be a mistake to reinstate an earlier permanent ban on military personnel wearing uniforms in public. That ban was put in force because of an IRA campaign in the 1970s and 1980s to target personnel in Britain, Germany and Holland. Personally, I would argue against it, he told the Today programme. As we saw in this case, you don't need to have somebody in uniform. You just need to have someone who knows a bit about soldiers and does a bit of observation in the vicinity of a barracks and you can identify a soldier very quickly. The Ministry of Defence has already announced it is increasing security at all barracks in London. Philip Hammond, the Defence Secretary, said that the government took the security of armed force personnel very seriously. World Date says, I personally signed a petition yesterday calling for armed force personnel to wear their uniforms with pride at all times necessary. The only answer our government will have will be to reduce the armed forces even more so they're not a threat to the Muslim communities in the future. A total wipeout in reality. We should be pushing more money their way, not less. European News. Dutch Prime Minister, European olive oil rules are bizarre. Plans by the European Commission to stop restaurants placing refillable cruets of olive oil on tables are bizarre, says Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte. Brussels says the rules, which require olive oil bottles to be sealed and labelled, are necessary to ensure customers know exactly what they're eating and that the oil is of good quality. Rutte said the Netherlands has campaigned against the ruling, but that it was passed by a qualified majority. I think it's too bizarre for words and incomprehensible to come with this sort of proposal at a time like this, Rutter told MPs during a debate on Tuesday evening. It'll add to the burden on the hospitality industry and inspectorate. It is also bad for the environment. World Day states, I really don't know what these lazy, out-of-touch, greedy bastards in the EU know what to do next to F up Europe. Demolish the whole thing, kit and caboodle, and the world will be a better place, and we certainly would in the UK. The only laws the EU passes are the laws they are paid to pass. It'll be easier to become a Dane. The Danish Justice Ministry announced changes today designed to make it easier for foreigners to obtain Danish citizenship. Among the changes which will come into effect on June the 15th are a lessening of the Danish language and self-sufficiency requirements, changes to residency requirements, a promise to bring down case handling times and a pledge to move forward in allowing dual citizenship. The Justice Minister, Morten Bedskov, Social Democrats, stated in a press release that the requirements for becoming a Danish citizen should be high but realistic to live up to. With this new agreement, we have given individuals better incentive to integrate themselves because the requirements are now more realistic, Bodskov said. It is my expectation that the changes will make a positive contribution to successful integration. Well, today it says, Poor bugger, he's really on the multicultural horse, isn't he? Watch and learn, Morton. Watch and learn. Amnesty EU states guilty of racism and homophobia. Several EU countries abuse the rights of migrants and ethnic minorities, while others are not doing enough to combat homophobia. 
Amnesty International has said. The British-based NGO named 24 EU states in its annual report on rights abusers out on Thursday, 23rd of May. Rough treatment of refugees from Africa and Asia, harsh enforcement of counter-terrorism laws against Muslims, and naked racism against Roma people emerged as systematic problems in Europe. Despite previous promises to the European Commission, France in the first quarter of last year evicted 9,040 Roma people, with local authorities in many cases flouting international safeguards against the practice. French police ignored new rules against ethnic profiling on ID checks. Germany refused to grant refugee rights for 195 people from Tunisia and 105 people from Iraq. Italy continued to stuff Roma into ethnically segregated camps. Spain booted out 70 migrants from the island of Isla de Terreira to Morocco. Italy, Germany and the UK faced criticism over their use of counter-terrorist laws to detain or extradite mostly Muslim suspects. Cell issues came up time and again in Belgium, Bulgaria, Croatia to join the EU in July. Cyprus, the Czech Republic, Denmark, Latvia, Malta, the Netherlands, Poland, Romania, Slovakia and Sweden. In Estonia and Latvia, 400,000 Russophone people cannot get citizenship and their stateless existence aggravates their poverty and isolation. Complaints over the handling of homophobic incidents cropped up in Bulgaria, Croatia, Italy, Lithuania and Slovakia. But Greece and Hungary caused the most worry. World at eight states. These numbers are small in comparison with the huge amounts of migrants we're talking about who regularly enter European countries and benefit over the indigenous populations in many cases. If they don't like it, go home should be the message, to them and to Amnesty. Another organisation paid to find fault with everything in Western society. Isn't that awful Chakrabarti part of these idiots? Oh no, 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 I forgot. She's a director of liberty, which roughly sounds the same, doesn't it? With regard to our Nick Griffin and his usual belly of the beast report, our chairman sends his apologies, but he's in Woolwich today and can't join us at the World at Eight this Friday. World News. Syria rebels threaten to wipe out Shiite and Alawite towns. Communities inhabited by Shiite Muslims and President Bashar al-Assad's Alawite minority will be wiped off the map if the strategic city of Al-Khazar in the central Syria falls to government troops, rebel forces said. We don't want this to happen, but it will be a reality imposed on everyone. Colonel Abdel Hamid Zakaria, a spokesman for the Free Syrian Army in Turkey, told Al Arabiya television yesterday. It's going to be an open sectarian bloody war to the end. World to date comments. Yep, that's what happens when a body of people rebel against a government, especially when helped from the outside. <laughs> Afghan university students protest against women's rights. More than 200 male students protested in Kabul yesterday against women's rights, calling for the repeal of a presidential decree on the elimination of violence against women, which they say is un-Islamic. The decree bans child and forced marriages, makes domestic violence a crime, and says that rape victims cannot be prosecuted for adultery. It also outlaws ba'ad, a traditional practice of interchanging women or girls to settle disputes or debts. The protest came days after Conservative lawmakers blocked an attempt to turn a the decree into law. Morlada Jalali, the Mueller of the University Mosque, was one of the protest organisers. Yesterday he called for Parliament to repeal the decree. Demonstrators slammed the decree imposed by foreigners for violating Sharia. The parliamentary speaker entered the debate Saturday after fierce opposition from Conservative lawmakers who said several provisions, including the ban on child marriage and jail time for domestic abuse, violated Islamic law. Boy Scouts of America vote to admit openly gay youths. The Boy Scouts of America voted Thursday to allow openly gay youths as members, while continuing its policy of excluding openly gay adult leaders. More than 1,400 delegates from Scout Councils across the country adopted the plan, proposed by their top leaders after a year of growing public pressure and bitter internal debate. Gay rights advocates inside and outside the scouting organisation called the decision a milestone, but vowed to continue pressing the Scouts to end the exclusion of gay adults. Religious and conservative Scout leaders and parents accused the organisation of caving in to political pressure, and some said they would leave the Boy Scouts. World Today says... Whilst not being anti-gay, I do think that some organisations, namely the Scouts, Churches and other youth organisations, should not change their rules and admit gays for just being gay. 
These young boys should be treated as normal hetero guys, as in the past, and not lauded because of their sexuality. The whole issue has got out of all proportion. Thought for the day. The beginning of the end or the start of a new beginning. Of course, this thought must concern the terrible event in South London. But I was already going to highlight today, before the murder, what immigration has done to our country and the rending and tearing away at our now fractured society that occurs every day, every month and every year from the impact of huge amounts of peoples from the Muslim third world countries into the very hearts of our communities. The media, police and politicians are treating this vicious and unnecessary crime as something separate from Islam because, like it or not, this crime was committed in the name of Allah in broad daylight, in public and on the streets of our once great capital city, London. The British National Party will quite rightly vilify Islam and its followers for this heinous crime on an innocent man, but it's clear from the very early reportings and writings that the media will not follow that line at all. In fact, although a line has been drawn, it has not been drawn by the British press or indeed the so-called dozens of witnesses who stood around and watched and filmed this truly terrible act perpetrated on a young serving soldier. The media are concentrating on three things only and are reporting this crime as if it was an everyday occurrence in the UK and are, as instructed from on high, leaving out any form of emotive expression. They're reporting on the victim, the killers and the apparent fear they have of reprisals being carried out on the Muslim communities. The reasoning is beyond reason, but the media are portraying the killers as being radicalised by the web, not Islam, mosques or their local communities. We have the name of the victim, Drummer Lee Rigby, 2nd Battalion of the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers, aged just 25. He leaves a widow and a very young son of two years, who will never know his father, and believe me, I've been there. The newscasters harp on about Lee's bubbly character and being well loved within his regiment, but skip the most obvious parts about this killing. Firstly, he was white, and there are many black and ethnic British soldiers that could have been targeted. Secondly, he was run over by the murderer's car first, to render him unable to fight back. True heroes of Islam, these killers. And last but not least, dozens of bystanders, or witnesses, or collaborators, stood by and watched, whilst these two bastards tried to carve Lee's head off which is no easy feat and takes more than a few minutes. At this moment in time, I personally don't know who I hate the most. The ignorant and stupid African killers or the equally vacuous, cowardly and mainly ethnic males who stood back and watched this murder and we allow them into the UK to breed yet more killers. Of the bystanders, or cowards as I call them, two black women went to Lee's body after the event whilst the two killers were parading around giving a lecture in world politics and army movements and a third scout leader or whatever is being hailed as the heroine of some sort, which she ain't. She is obviously from the northern part of Europe and clearly an amateur psychologist or social worker and talked down one of the killers. She was very careful with her words and I really don't know what she did that was so marvellous. I would have been tempted to rip out his eyes myself, but obviously would have had to act alone in that respect and I would have been arrested for damaging his human's whatever. Damaging his human rights. Boris the Loris Johnson, in a desperate bid to deviate from the sheer horror of that event on the news, lauded this woman to the heavens in an act of sheer deflection. The Loris was practically creaming his drawers over the police in their turnout time of nine minutes, which is a long time getting your head hacked off. And what were the enriched public doing? Bugger all, that's what. Oh no, no, I'm wrong. There were lots of large black guys taking pictures of the event on their phones for posterity. And it's obvious to all that the establishment are petrified of us nationalists who they laughingly call the far right, creating division in this highly enriched area of our capital city. More than likely, they're afraid of us calling a spade a spade, a Muslim a Muslim, and a murderer a murderer. The other people who seemed to be missing were Lee's fellow soldiers standing outside the Woolwich barracks. Surely someone heard or saw something not quite right. It must be known that in the heavily soiled ethnic area, where you see a gathering of more than two people, something is amiss. It's either a Muslim protest march or a killing. Then the report centres on the killers, who, true to British justice, are suffering non-life-threatening injuries in one of our hospitals under heavy armed guard. I think you all know my feelings on that one. Although two barely live Muslims can give information, two dead ones can't. So the police didn't shoot to kill, as they would have done a white guy who just killed a black man. No, they shot to maim. From my personal point of view, between the eyes would have done just right. 
end of, and send the families the bill for the bullets, and then deport them bag and baggage. They name these two as Michael Adibolejo from Romford, 28, and Michael Adibowali from Greenwich, 22, whose girlfriend was arrested yesterday in their flat. What the papers refer to as Mr. Adibolaji was the creature in the black hat doing the talking. He apparently was at a Muslim protest in 2007 and is known to the security guys. Well, that did a lot of good, didn't it? He's also known to have converted after his free schooling as a student at the University of Greenwich, which he attended during 2003 to 2005. What is interesting is, apart from the apparent phrasing of suspects and the floating over the fact that these shites are Muslims, was the heavy emphasis on the web and their part in radicalising certain young Islamic men. Although, in my knowledge of Islam, you can't convert online. Much emphasis was placed in the carefully monitored reports on all channels and in all the media. The fact that this act of murder has been placed as an act of terrorism, which encompasses homegrown white terrorists and nationalists, of course, and Islam as being the root cause is being firmly booted out of the press door. It's clearly not in the interest of the British people to be given the true facts because of the reprisals that might inconvenience the Muslim immigrants and communities in our midst school of multiculturalism mantras. The emphasis on the local communities overtook the actual crime and the people interviewed were a couple of elderly whites who didn't really know the time of day and a young pair of white slappers who commented, well, we all have to live round here, don't we? They might have, if they were more educated, have come straight out of the diversity course of Frankfurt School of Indoctrination. Despite all the obvious media deflections on the actual root of this murder and the connotations it will bring to the UK, they are playing it very safe and concentrating on how everyone present had acted impeccably. Yeah, not so impeccably that they actually moved a muscle to stop the murder of a white man in an obviously very mixed area by two black guys yelling Allahu Akbar, so no medals there. And of course the media are concentrating on the supposed revenge attacks on Muslims suffering from the murder more than the victim and his poor bereaved family. All of us nationalists will be pleased to know that two men have been arrested from separate attacks on mosques in Kent and Essex. The attacks were actually a small firework in one and graffiti writings on the other. No murders, no beheadings and no communities burnt out. So I think Islam has got away rather lightly myself. But then this is England, isn't it? I'm surprised we aren't all celebrating in the streets at what immigration and the multicultural society have achieved. This is nothing compared with what could have happened if the circumstances had been reversed and two white soldiers had run over and decapitated a Muslim civilian on the streets in the UK, or, furthermore, the even less likely incident of a couple of white Brits going to North Africa or Saudi, and I say going because we Christians or Europeans can't immigrate to those countries, let alone breed, acquiring a car and running over a Muslim soldier, and then proceeding to stab him and decapitate him. What do you really think the locals would do? I don't think for a minute they would look on or allow women to intervene or take pictures or generally have a chat whilst exclaiming how terrible, do you? No. These white men would be ripped to pieces in minutes. No trial, no police, no courts, no hospitals, no inquiries, no comments, no newspaper articles. Just a small news item in Al Jazeera. Two British men killed whilst attempting to murder Muslim soldier, probably Zionist spies. So we have the jaw-droppingly ghastly footage of poor drummer Rigby's murder, totally ignored by passers-by, probably because most of them were ethnic and in an enriched area. The police and politicians running up their own arses trying to deflect it all away from Islam and immigration and enlarging the bad effect this murder will have on the huge and frightening Muslim communities in this country. This case will die the death, just like Lee. It will not be hyped up like the Lawrence case because we Brits are not important to our government or its officers. And that is the one sentence that Adi Bolejo got right. After murdering Lee during the 20 minutes after these two animals, an insult to animals, gave a lecture on justifying their awful crime to those present, still watching, and from which the police seemed strangely absent. And the Great Brit public just allowed these primitives to walk and talk whilst the blood from a murdered soldier was running into the gutters. The Muslim murderers blamed the wars in Muslim countries, but from what I can see, you can't blame foreign wars or British troops in Iraq or Afghanistan for all the ills that have and will befall us in the future. Most of the Iraqis were killed by their own, and Afghanis are still killing more of their own than we Brits are. Anyway, these animals' roots are in Nigeria. 
I believe, where the Muslims kill Christians for sport. Now our liberal and socialist politicians won't even break wind over this crime. In fact, I doubt if many of them will say anything other than the usual condolences and clucking. UKIP's Farage has said, I hope and believe that this is an isolated incident, an appeal for calm amongst all our communities. His statement also included this typical PC comment from a moderate Muslim, Mr Amjad Bashir, chairman of the Zouk group of companies, who said, British Muslims will be as disgusted by this attack as anyone else in the UK. I condemn it utterly. Well, of course he does. He would have to, wouldn't he? All the Muslims in high places, and there are hundreds of them, will roundly condemn the two black Muslim jihadists, but will provide legal aid, I'm sure, if they ever come to trial. Kamoran also said, this murder has nothing to do with Islam. Oh yes, of course not. Perish the thought. Whether I'm deemed a racist for what I'm about to say doesn't bother me one jot. But there can be no fouler mixture from mankind than that of a black African and a Muslim. Lack of brains and fanaticism results in total chaos and brutality on legs, and over here, and breeding. I will leave you with this thought for the weekend, along with our heartfelt sympathy for Lee Rigby's wife, child, family, and his regiment. From the Quran, Surah 9123. Fight those of the unbelievers who live near you, and show them how harsh you can be. Lest we forget. And finally, there is no finally today in respect to drummer Lee Rigby. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozar, and I and the team at World at Eight and Radio Britain wish you all a very happy and safe bank holiday weekend. <laughs>